this is Mr. Wallington, Larry Wallington. I'm your instructor for CYB 410. This is a, uh, a great course. It's defensive cybersecurity. We're going to go over just a, an overview of the entire course, and then I'm going to get into my week one lecture. So when we think about uh, what we got going this week, or this week, well, they really put it for the next eight weeks. This is a great course. It gets really gets into the uh, theories, concepts, methodologies of how we analyze and assess cybersecurity and vulnerabilities within an organization. Look at some of the topics we're going to we'll talk about, and hopefully everybody had the prerequisite courses going into this. But we're going to get into some things like uh, network security techniques, cryptography, um, uh, application and OS level patches, vulnerabilities, uh, social engineering, and talk about analytical tools that we use in this environment. Like I said, the course material is the book, Defensive Cybersecurity. Uh, the, and also every week we've got thread discussions with some biblical integration uh, videos that I'm going to add into the course each uh, each week just for some discussions. Okay, so and and the last um, uh, assignment you're going to have is a critical um, assignment. It's, it's a capstone project. You're going to work that throughout each week of the course. So when we think about on a weekly basis, like saying we're going to walk through this week one. What are we talking about? How to create a security program? Um, you're going to get to asset management documentation, the different policies associated with that. Going into week two, we're gonna look at standards and some procedures, user education and incident response. This is a biggie. Uh, this is one of those areas that's not as flamboyant. I mean, it's not the technical stuff that most people wanna do when they think about cybersecurity. However, user education, especially when it comes to insider threat, things like that, extremely important. Also, understanding how to build an incident response program, very important. What do you do when you have an incident? What are the steps you go through? Looking at week three, uh, very, uh, <clears throat> piggyback and route that incident response is disaster recovery. That's what we're going to talk about that. What do you do when you have a disaster? How do you recover from that disaster? As well as some of the compliance standards, frameworks, and physical security. Week four, we'll get into some Windows and Linux endpoint operating systems and, and some of the security uh, techniques and analysis that we do within those operating systems. Week five, we're going to talk about password management multi-factor authentication, talk about some of the things with, associated with network infrastructure and segmentation, how we segment networks for better security. So week six, vulnerability management. I actually, this is a fun area, vulnerability management, uh, development, purple teaming. You may have heard, you know, red team, blue teams, but yes, we also have uh, purple teams as well. Week seven, IDS, IPS is intrusion detection systems and uh, intrusion prevention systems. How you do logging, monitoring, how we look at email servers, DNS, and and what we call security through obscurity, hiding things in plain sight. And week eight, like I said, we'll round it off with our capstone project. So a lot of things going on over the next eight weeks. Should be a very interesting class, of course. All right, let's look at week one. We're gonna break, uh, break down week one a little bit. Now, I will tell you when I do my lecture videos, they don't follow always what's in the book or in the syllabus because you can read the book and you've got the syllabus. So what I wanted to really take the opportunity to try to do each each week as I go through our uh, lectures is to bring some of the uh, my, my real world experiences with cybersecurity. That's what I've done. I work as a, an, an ISM, an ISSM, Information System Security Manager, which is a management position at a company called Raytheon Technologies. I'd say uh, one of the largest defense contractors in the world. Uh, over. 26 years of active duty Air Force and quite a bit of time in uh, the uh, government sector as a contractor. So a lot of experience and I really want to help you, hopefully you guys get off to a good start with your career after you finish uh, school. So some of the, some of the things that I'm going to cover in, in my PowerPoint are not what you're going to see in the books. It's supplemental to that, but I think it's some good information. All right. I always like to start off with what I call food for thought because there's so <clears throat> much um, hype around cybersecurity these days. And, and for a good reason, yes, there's a lot of threats, there's a lot of vulnerabilities, there's a lot of attack vectors we have to close down. But sometimes we have to think about um, how we think about situations like this. So one thing that I learned years ago, okay, people who know why will always tell people who know how what to do. And here's what I'm, and this is why this is so critical. Um, we teach a lot of the how of security, cybersecurity, whatever it may be, but really, Understanding the why is so much more important many times. And that's what I like said, what I really wanted to, to share with you, you guys in a class over the next eight, eight weeks is some of the why. Now, let me make you make an example. Let me give you an analogy. You see this? Right. This is a football player off of every 30, all 32 teams in the NFL. These guys know how to play football. They're great at it. They understand how to execute plays and do those things. However, this is a snapshot of some of the owners, NFL owners. They know the why. And that is why players 
will always be subordinate to owners. They can strike as much as they want, doesn't matter. The guys who know why will always tell the guys who know how what to do. So think about that you know, as you go in your organization, learning the why is so important. I can tell you the how, I can teach you how to uh, harden and secure a server. But if you don't know the why, or I should say better yet, as you start to learn and understand the why, then you start understanding the, the security uh, ramifications that I am not protecting a server. It's the data, it's the information, it's the intellectual property that that server is processing. That's what I'm protecting. So just hardening a server just for the, for the sake of hardening, really, okay, I got the how down, but what I haven't grasped is the why. That leads us into what we call security governance, okay? When you think about security, and this isn't really, a lot of this isn't any aspect of life, but we're just taking some, some basic concepts and principles and overlaying them over our cybersecurity. Now, the thing I like to always talk about is what I call strategic vision, tactical implementation, operational execution. Now, you may sound like, well, that's not like a military strategy. Well, it kind of is. After 26 years in the military, I bring a lot of that, a lot of that mindset to the table. So when we think about strategic vision, this is looking for you know, that two to 10 year vision, looking out of uh, where we think the organization is going, where the business is going, where the threat vectors are coming from in the next two to 10 years. What's the attack surface? What are the vulnerabilities in our infrastructure? We're thinking out in, in, that, in those terms. Tactical implementation is now how, within that one to two year period. Now that I kind of understand from a strategic uh, perspective, what's gonna be happening, how do I start implementing these um, uh, tactics and techniques and procedures into our organization. And then at the operational, now we're talking days, weeks, months. Now I've got policies, processes, things rolled in. Now, how do I execute that on a day-to-day -day basis? And we do that by if you uh, having the right governance in place, the governance structure. At the strategic vision level, this is when really when we're talking about doctrine and, and high level policies. So when we think doctrine, you know, national security strategy, those type, even, in your, even if you're not in the government sector and you're in a pr uh, private organization, you start to look at, okay, within our organization, what is the overarching strategy that our business is working toward so we know how to implement that? Once we understand that doctrine, then from there, we can develop policies. And those policies could be based in federal regulations, it could be based in your overarching company. Uh, policies, but it should always be linked to whatever that overarching doctrine is. Now, when we go into tactical implementation, that one to you, this is where we start developing processes and standards. You know, what type of processes, what type of security frameworks are we going to use? What um, controls do we think we're going to have to put in place to manage and maintain our security infrastructure and our security posture and maintain confidentiality, integrity, and availability? And then when we get to these, these days, weeks, months, this is when we have actual procedures and checklists where we build forms and all those things. Now I would say in most organizations, we do it 100% backwards. We have a problem, we have a, a something we wanna do, what is the first thing that somebody says? Hey, well let's make a form so that we can capture data. Absolutely the wrong way to start because if you don't understand these top levels, creating a form or creating a, a website, <laughs> we're, we're starting backwards. So when you think about this strategic vision, tactical implementation, operational execution, you, know, you wanna kind of follow a, a process to get you from so that everything ties together from the top of the uh, requirements stack all the way down to the place that we actually now have checklists. We we're performing training and we're doing the things to execute the mission. So we do this and so that we can really focus on what we call security in depth. Um, very important concept. I'm sure hopefully sure you all may, may or may not be aware of security in depth. And really and what security in depth now is is undergirding as a term that's becoming gaining more and more popularity is zero trust, meaning that we don't trust anyone on the edge of our network as well as on the interior of our network. But to maintain zero trust, we have to understand what I call the golden egg. And this is what many times um, cyber slash network IT guys we missed. What are we protecting in our organization? Okay. What is the golden egg? Somewhere within your organization, somewhere within your, uh, where you are uh, working, there, there is some intellectual property. There's something of value. You know, let's say you work with Coca-Cola. Well, you know what? The formula that they use to make Coca-Cola is a is very valuable intellectual property. It's a trade secret. And so they want to keep that trade secret secure. And while they're going to pay some security, cybersecurity, or whoever it may be, lots of money to protect that. That's if you don't understand that, you maybe spend a lot of time doing a lot of work in areas that you're going to reap very little benefit from from a risk, risk mitigation, vulnerability protection. So now that we know where our secure uh, our golden egg where the critical data, and that's usually sitting in a file 
or in a folder structure somewhere. Now that folder structure is typically tied to some type of on a server. You know, you got some type of file server. All right. <clears throat> then a next layer back from that, you know, now we've got the, our network infrastructure so we can start tying these things together. Some type of core switch that ties to some type of access switch that connects to a user's computer, somebody, a user asset. So now this is a, just a very simple diagram of how, if we think about these layers, uh, now we can start building security in depth. And really this is um, no different than you do in your home, right? Let's say that this is the safe in your bedroom closet. And this is where you got the golden egg. This is where your life insurance policies, all your jewelry, and that's in the closet. Closet is locked. Here's your bedroom door. Company's coming over. You're going to be sure that's secure. This is <clears throat> the front room living area. You want to be sure that only people who are accessed to get back here is access. So you're controlling um, security in your home the same way that we do day to day on the network. And this is the front door. We're going to be sure we're guarding the front door and now and, and every layer in your home. So now when we think about this, this authorized user should have access to go. <clears throat> Whether they're you know on, on the whether they're on a VLAN, whatever structure they're on, this uh, this user and their computer, the asset and the object is able to get through that VLAN, hit this firewall where we've got now ACL rules, uh, access control list set up, so they should be able to go through there if they're authorized, and they may have an account on this server that says okay yes now then allows them to get to this critical data, but now you see also we use um, discretionary access control to ensure that whoever is the information owner can control who can actually get to these files. So you have multiple layers of security. You got the discretionary access controls on the files. We've got user account permission set up on the servers. Uh, we've got access control list on our core switch and routers. And we've got VLANs, we've got segmentation that's taking place so that we ensure that the authorized user is able to get to the golden egg. But at the same time, what else do we have? Yes, this is where we have adversaries. Some of these can be outside of our network, but really now what we're protecting against a lot is not just individuals trying to break down the front door, but it's our insider threat. So now we've got to ensure that our network components are set up so that this individual uh, who shouldn't be authorized, wouldn't have access to the VLANs to get to where they need to be, but let's say they can. They've broken through that uh, defense barrier, that defense corridor. Now they get here, so hopefully, the ACL rules are set up that this asset, this computer they're working on, the IP address, MAC address of that computer says, uh, no, you're not, you know, with, with port security, with the access control list, that that device cannot uh, traverse the network. But let's say they do have access and they're even closer. Now, the next layer of defense would be, well, you, they shouldn't have an account on this uh, server. So even if they can physically get here via layer two, layer three, now when we get here, you know, they shouldn't have the ability to log into that server. And if they can break down that door, the, you know, one of the last areas of defense is the DAC, the discretionary access control that we've placed on these folders. So even if they're here, those folders should be locked down to just the individuals who need to get there. Security and depth, depth. but it's really not just security and depth, it's how do we <laughs> protect critical information. CPI, critically protected information. Now, to do this, it requires people. Now, it's very important and I will say this is again one of those those non-technical administrative things that is so important in an organization that you learn it and learn it quickly. If you you know when you go into a new organization, who are the key stakeholders and what are their roles in this organization? You know, so you have external roles, you have uh, authorizing officials, uh, you have security controls assessors, uh, you may have a common control provider. I mean, it could be uh, Amazon, AWS, or someone else that's that's providing services cybersecurity services to your organization and somewhere there's a business owner who is who owns the information so these are some of your external roles uh it's people that make maybe some may be internal but many times these are external to your organization they may come in and they're inspecting or they're the ones who have the ability to make decisions uh, of the security posture now you also have internal roles internally you can have an information system owner that's the that is the individual or sometimes we call them program managers who are responsible for those information systems. Working closely with that ISO is our information system security engineer. They're the ones who we want to, who are responsible to the ISO for baking security in when these systems are being built. We have a, an ISSM, an information system uh, security manager. They're responsible for that day-to-day -day security posture, maintaining uh, cybersecurity hygiene and vigilance day-to-day. -day. 
Uh, and then uh, we have also like ISSOs who work with the ISMs uh, to execute that cyber hygiene vi vigilance. So knowing you know, key roles in your organization, not just from the cyber side, but also above that, external roles who are responsible for executing that within your organization. And one thing I know we've talked about briefly is CIA. You've heard this, uh, you've been in school for a while, I know you have, okay, and you're probably gonna, oh my God, CIA. What I will tell you guys, this is the bedrock of what we do. It really is. If you are looking at your, let's say you're gonna try to get your Security Plus or your CISSP or a C or a CISM or any other um, certification, cybersecurity certification, everything in those uh, books, everything in your study guides, they all tie back to one of these three concepts, confidentiality, integrity, availability, keeping secret, secret, secret. Um, so that it's not disclosed, you know, but using encryption, integrity. That's want to be sure that information hadn't changed from the time that I sent it to the time that somebody received it and need to use it. Availability. Now you say, well, why is this important? Because it depends on where you may work. Their focus may be in a different place. If I work for the DOD, okay, uh, for the military, our, our, a lot of our focus is here, confidentiality. We want to keep secret, secret. We don't want the adversary to be able to have access. Not that we ignore integrity and availability, very important. But when we categorize a system, we may say confidentiality, that's a high risk level. Integrity may be a medium risk level. Availability may be a medium or low risk level. Now, let's say you go to a bank and you're working for uh, Chase or JP Morgan. Oh, well, think about your bank, okay? Confidentiality is important, don't get me wrong. You don't want people being able to see your account, but what's more important than that? Think about it, availability and integrity. Availability meaning that I want my money, I want it now, okay? So if you can't get to your money because their ATM machines are down and everything else, then there's a problem because now you're gonna be moving to another bank. And also integrity, even if I can get to my money and I open up my account and the balance is wrong, meaning that there's been a breach in integrity, we have problems. We have problems. So you see in a bank, their uh, risk tolerances may be different than if you're working for the federal government or for the DO Department of Defense. Very important to understand that this is the bedrock. And right next to that is your information access model. Okay, because not only do you want things to be confidential, uh, 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 integrity is good, availability, but now it's about controlling access. Security, no matter whether you're talking physical, physical security, uh, personnel security, cybersecurity, network security, it all comes down to maintaining and controlling access, okay? And here's what I mean. When we think about access, I and four A's, you know, the I four A, and you may hear it called triple A if you're in the Cisco environment, but identification, authentication, authorization, access control, auditing. Let me give you a little scenario with that, okay? Let's say if I come to your house, yes, I drive from Dallas, Texas to California, <laughs> and I knock on your door. And I said, hey, this is Mr. Wallington, your agent online instructor. Well, you don't, want me, you don't want to see some identification. You're not probably just going to open the door. Like, who is this guy standing outside my door? So, okay, I, I, I'll give you some identification. But are you just going to trust that identification just because I say that I am who I am? No, you're not. You're going to want to authenticate that, right? So you want to say, okay, no, no, put slides your driver's license. Give me, show me something because I don't know who you are. You just, you could be anyone. So you want to authenticate that, yes, this person behind the door is who they say they are. All right, once you do that and you let me into your house, are you going to give me free reigns to run all over your house? Hey, I'm just going to go into your bedroom and, hey, can I see inside of your wife's closet? I don't think so. So what are you going to do? You're going to authorize where I can go in that house, right? You're going to say, okay, while you're here, especially at 2 o'clock in the morning, your kids are in bed and everyone else, you're going to ensure that I probably even stay in the hall in the, in the den or maybe in that little front sitting area you got in your house. That's as far as you're going to go. Just the only place you're authorized to go. And if I say, hey, I, I need to use your bathroom. Yeah, the master bath, off limits. You're going to let me use that little hallway bathroom, the ones with the towels that nobody ever used. That's the one I'm, <laughs> that's the one I'm going to use, okay? So you authorize where I can go in your house. Now, even though I may be authorized to sit in your, your den while you're trying to figure out why I'm here, I look over and you've got this, this killer gaming system console right there. And I'm just going to pick up the joystick, uh, the controller, and I'm going to start playing, right? No. You're going to also control the access. Even though I'm authorized to be in, 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 this, in your den, I don't have access to those things in there without permission. And after I get up and leave, 
you're going to do what? You're going to audit. You're going to look around the den. It's like, I hope everything's intact. He didn't touch anything, did he? I know he was over there messing with your game system. You may, may want to check that out. You're going to audit. I'm telling you, these two concepts is the bedrock of what we do in security. Okay? When you log into your computer, you let's say if you're still using passwords, um, or, or you may log in up with a username, you're providing identification. And you may have two-factor authentication. So now you have a, a fob, or you have a some type of cat card or whatever, that's going to authenticate your identification. When that happens, the, the network architecture, Active Directory, LDAP, it's going to say, okay, yes, I recognize this individual, and you are authorized to go to these locations on the network. You can get to these folders. And uh, these, and, and even though I may be able to get to a folder, I doesn't mean I have access to every file in that folder structure. Then, when, and, 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 and everything that you've been doing is being audited in the process. So, so how we maintain security in your house, same structure applies to the network. Because really it comes down to one thing, what? Risk, yes, that is what we do. Manage risk, articulate and manage risk. What is risk? Like I say, this is the, you know, the, the, the global formula for risk. The likelihood of a threat agent taking advantage of a vulnerability and the corresponding business impacts. Guys, lock that in, lock it in. When we're talking about defensive cyber, well, if we can't defend against things that we want, if we don't know what the vulnerabilities are, if we don't know what the threats are, and really what is the likelihood of exploitation. Everything else we're doing is window dressing. So we have to understand vulnerabilities, threats, likelihood of exploitation. So when we talk about risk, there are some risk mitigation strategies, very important. Which can you do at risk? You can avoid it, you can transfer it, you can accept it, or you can mitigate it. Avoiding risk, that means, okay, hey, if I don't like uh, hurricanes, I'm gonna move to Nebraska. So I'm avoiding hurricanes by moving to Nebraska. Ne Nebraska. Transferring it, I buy insurance. Well, I don't like hurricanes, but I'm gonna stay in Florida. But here, while I'm in Florida, what am I going to do? I am going to buy flood insurance so that in case of a hurricane, that my risk has been transferred to all state, state farm, USAA, whomever. I can accept the risk. That's those people who live in Florida. They know the hurricane's coming, but they're out there on that little island and going, I'm not moving. We're going to ride it out. You're accepting the risk. Yeah, I'm going to be okay. You've seen them in the, after the hurricane. They, well, thank God for uh, protecting us out there. No, he said you should have, you know, used another, another one of the risk mitigation strategies. And mitigate. That's how actions to prevent against attack. So even though I might want to ride it out, I'm going to reduce the risk, but I'm going to put up plywood, I'm going to put up sandbags, all these things. I'm putting controls in place to help mitigate the risk. So the risk strategies. And really, for, if you think cyber, that's what we do. We're the, we are, we are a key stakeholder, key stakeholder in risk mitigation. And understanding how to articulate that within your chain of command uh, in your organization is critical, 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 critical because many times we try to provide a solution when really it's the information system owner's responsibility for the solution. What we want to have to give them is options, COAs, courses of action, you know, because it's all about, if they want to take the risk, got it, you know? So we're providing courses of action. This is what we can do to mitigate the risk. Now, it's a business decision. Do we want to pay the money? Do we want to make the investment in hardware, software, infrastructure and to mitigate risk to what level? Meaning that, no, because we'll, you'll never mitigate 100% of the risk. So risk mitigation strategies. Now, how we set up risk mitigation strategies is through uh, security controls. And many times these security controls are, are they're covered in different types of frameworks or different types of, of um, guides and templates. And there's there's many of these. Like, I've just kind of listed a couple of those. ISO uh, 27001. ISO 27005. If you work with the federal government, one you probably have heard of is the RMF, the Risk Management Framework. You got COBIT 5, uh, RIMS. There's there's just tons of it. If you work in a in the finance industry, uh, you may see PCI, uh, uh, DSS PCI. There's just a ton of these frameworks. But all these frameworks have something in common. One thing in common is a list of security controls. And what security controls are things that we try to uh, put in place to mitigate risk. So what do I mean by that? So if we look at a piece of our critical information systems within a network, right? So let's say we have a critical server or critical, that's got critical information there. All types of vulnerabilities. You got network vulnerabilities, you got system vulnerabilities, uh, physical, environmental vulnerabilities. 
unintentional insider threats, people who aren't trained well, different types of vulnerabilities. And over here, we have all types of threats. We got external attacks, you got vandalism, like I say untrained users. These are threats. Now, these threats are always trying to attack or exploit the various vulnerabilities, which is why we put different security controls in place. Some of these security controls would be, uh, I wanna have be sure that my router is able to um, have access control list so that I'm controlling who can enter and egress, ingress, egress my network. Physical controls. Okay, yeah, let's put uh, keyboard protectors because the area we work in, there's a lot of, could be a lot of moisture. So we're gonna do physical controls to, to protect our keyboards. We're gonna be sure we have antivirus running, some type of, you know, some type of mal code, uh, malware uh, detection software running. So these are controls that we put in place to reduce the likelihood of these threats exploiting these vulnerabilities. However, like I say, you can never, I mean, it is so hard to mitigate 100%. They never equal. So then what happens? You have residual risk. This is after I've applied my controls, this is the amount of risk that's left over. Like, okay, we've put everything in place, but you know what? There's still some level of vulnerability there. And that's where the ISO, the information system owner, that's where your, your C-suite, your CISO, your CIO makes that decision. Do we accept that risk or do we and do or do we do a, a trade study or cost benefit analysis to see what it would take to mitigate this risk? Because the thing you don't want to do, you don't want to spend $50 protecting a $5 asset. So many times it's okay, okay, we can accept this level of risk as opposed to spending additional dollars to try to close the gap. Now, or it may be that, hey, this is so important. Yes, we need to do that. So that is where security controls come into play. Now, what controls are we putting in place? What's the cost of implementing these controls? Uh, and then we also wanna know what is the effectiveness of those controls? We put them in place, how effective are they? That's, that's why we do security assessments to assess the effectiveness of these controls when they're implemented. And then we continuously monitor or conmon these controls on a some type of periodicity. It could be weekly, daily, continuous. It could be monthly, annually. We need to go back and look at these controls. So thinking about controls, security controls, there's a relationship between the different types of controls. Like I say, within a control, especially when we're looking at these frameworks, you're gonna see administrative controls, things like background checks, uh, annual reviews, you know, termination procedures, physical controls, fences, motion sensors, security guards, technical controls, firewalls, and like I say, inter uh, uh, IDSs, intrusion detection systems, and you know, system backup restore processes. Now, we can also look at this kind of from a metrics perspective, across a, a, a metrics, some controls are preventative, some controls are detective, and some controls are corrective. What do I mean by that? Background checks, it's an administrative control, but it's preventive, meaning that I wanna do background checks before I bring this person onto my, into my work uh, environment because the background check says, eh, that's probably not the person you wanna hire, right? Uh, offense, that's a physical a preventative control. I'm trying to prevent people from getting into my facility. And on the technical side, like a fire, technical side, I'm sorry, like a firewall. A firewall is, is a uh, preventative. Okay, I'm going to set a firewall in place so that you know a the adversary they can't ping, they can't do any type of DDoS attacks uh, and keep them out of the network. The same with detective controls, annual reviews, mo a motion sensor. Okay, all it's going to do is detect. Hey, there's something out there. My, my ring camera. That's a detective control. It's detecting that there's activity. It's not going to prevent anything, and it's not going to correct anything. So corrective controls. Terminations, meaning that something's happened and we're gonna terminate this individual. It's an administrative control, but it's a corrective in nature. Uh, security guards, now security guards can actually fall in, in a multiple categories. A security guard could be a corrective control. Somebody broke in your building, they show up and apprehend them. It can also be a detective control, meaning that they are seeing it, they, they go and they do their, their checks, right? So, and it also can be preventative, meaning that if I have a security guard posted, then that could prevent people from saying, ah, I was gonna you know, do something malicious, but ah, I see the security guard. So you see a security guard can actually fall in multiple places. So when you think about the control relationships, now when you look into any of these um, uh, frameworks that I just talked about, you're gonna see control families. And these families of controls, uh, everything from access control, training, auditing, uh, identification, authentication, incident response, th these families is what now uh, are, are the, the tactics and techniques that's used to put in place to reduce risk in these particular areas. Now you'll see some of these are administrative, some of them are technical, and some most are a combination of both. There's 
Rarely is there just a purely administrative or purely technical control. Many times they, they both blend together. There may be an administrative component, meaning that we gotta have a policy in place to, to uh, oversee the guidance of how to do this technical, how to implement the technical control. So that's just a, a backdrop of what sec security controls are. Regardless of which framework you operate in, you're gonna see a, a similar looking group of security controls. Now, when we think about security, um, sometimes we, 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 there's two organizations that we work closely together, but we're kind of like siblings, a lot of sibling rivalry. That's our IT department and our cybersecurity department, right? Very close, a lot of similar skill sets. Um, in the, in the cybersecurity programs you guys are going through, you got a lot of networking training as well as uh, security. What I like to make the, the delineation is the differences between the two, okay? So when I'm thinking about security, uh, the enterprise, the, across the enterprise, what does security bring to the table? What is IT? And I use this analogy. I love, I love analogies, okay? It's like making shaved ice, kind of, kind of like making shaved ice. So have a, yeah, your, your business, your company, your organization produces something. It has some type of intellectual property. It has something that it produces, right? So the customer in this scenario is this little kid who wants some shaved ice, okay? And our job is to um, provide that shaved ice to, to add value, okay? So what to, to make shaved ice, what is the, the first thing you're going to need, right? Water. You got it. So think, so we're coming from the, the city water plant, and think of the IT guy as kind of the plumber. They are providing the connectivity to get water into our facility, okay? And then that water goes to the cybersecurity side, CIA. That's us. I can say very similar skills, different focus. If you look at a plumber and you look at a city water inspector, they can, both can talk about plumbing. They can talk about pipe size, uh, pipe angles, rise over run, all the things associated with that. However, you ask a, uh, a plumber about the pH balance of your water. What's the rust content? And he's going to probably give you that look. I don't know. Don't care. I just turned it on. I got it in your house and you can take a shower. These. Cyber, uh, the city water inspector, like us in cyber, we are concerned about the quality, the confidentiality, integrity, and the availability of the data that's going through those pipes, okay? So you see, very similar skill sets, but the focus, focus area is really different. Many times we get network security confused with cyber security. And you're probably saying, what? I thought they were the same. No, no, there's a fundamental difference between network. When I'm saying I'm going to secure the network, that's yes. I'm going to harden my operating systems. I'm going to be sure I got port security turned on. I've got uh, on my switches and routers, many things that I can do to secure the network. That's all great. It has to be done. Extremely important. Okay. And I've patched my systems. All these things have been done. However, when we think about cybersecurity, now I'm thinking, okay, how secure is that data? Because I can have a, a, a Windows 10 or a server 2019 hardened patched to the hill. But if I have a, an account, I have, if I have someone in the organization who has a privileged user account that shouldn't have it and can do privileged user escalations, then they have completely bypassed all of the hardening that I've done on that system. Because that's a cybersecurity role to, to look at who has access, who has accounts, managing account management, uh, to ensure that you've got the right roles, uh, that's doing the right job that we have separation of duties so that the system administrator isn't the same person that's auditing so so when we think about those skill sets from a cyber now the, do it is it helpful that i understand as a cyber guy uh vlan vlan tagging you know 802 uh 1x all these technical things uh subnetting yes you know how how to subnet and all these things yes very important but i'm looking at it from a different angle I'm looking at it from the perspective that I need to know what VLANs are out there, what they're servicing. So now I understand what data is traversing those VLANs, who has access to the VLANs, what machines, um, and what do they have, which folders do they have access to? So like I said, very different focus, but both are extremely important when it comes to um, making shaved ice in this, in this particular thing. A plumber and the water inspector, very important because you can get the water up here, but if it's rust, the rust content is too high, that's gonna be some nasty shaved ice. And this little kid's gonna be very upset. All right, so now where, where does it go? Now that, that water, we've gotten it here, we've, we, the quality is good, and now it goes into our process, an input output process, somewhere in the business that you work in, this happens. That we call a value stream, where we take a raw product like water, freeze it, 
grind it up in a machine, put some flavor in it, and what we've done, we've added value. We've added value to that water from the time it came in as an input to the time it goes as an output. So that's the value stream in your organization. Very critical for cyber that we understand the value stream because now we have a better idea of what we're protecting. You know, what's valuable? What's what's the, uh, like I said, the golden egg? What is this company producing? And how do we protect, you know, that IP, that intellectual property for what's being produced? And now out, the output of that goes to the customer. That little boy, he has shaved ice. Why? Because our, D, our IT guys got water from the city to us. We verified the, the quality of that water. Like I say, the pH balance, the rust content, if there's too much sulfur or whatever it may be, so that when it gets here, the quality of the output based on that value stream is good and we have a good product going out of the door. So when we think about cyber, just don't think about it from the aspect of just security. No, you are part of that value stream. And along the way, at every step, yes, we just talked about risk, risk involved to that. All right, so let's put this all together, right? You know, kind of uh, <laughs> springboard from that last slide. So when we think, and this is really taken from the uh, uh, defense acquisition course of how, uh, with respect to system development, life cycle management, and your security framework, they all fit together. Now I will say though, this is something that's very, sometimes very well overlooked in organizations because they just wanna go out and buy stuff and now let's strap on security afterwards. And really, it should be an integrated process. What do I mean by that? All right, let's say let's say that you know I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a military example. I was in the Air Force, so we're going to use an Air Force asset, uh, the radar on an aircraft. So let's say that your your company, like where I work for Raytheon, they have a a new idea for a great radar that can look around a corner and see stuff. So they have an initial concept. And then from there it goes into a milestone review where it's called concept refinement. So now you know, if they start from just something on a piece of paper on a napkin to now we have a breadboard to say, yeah, I think we can do this. Then at milestone B, they say, well, let's integrate that into a platform. So now they'll go out and get an aircraft and they're gonna put that radar in the nose of that aircraft, do a demonstration to the, to the Air Force, say, Air Force, I think we've got something that's gonna work. You're gonna like that. We got the test procedures. And, and hopefully when you hit milestone C, the Air Force says, yes, we love it. And we want a hundred of those. And then it goes into production. They deploy it. It goes out and flies. And we have to sustain it after that. That's the normal life cycle. Now, if you look at most businesses, they have some type of a life cycle like this, where products flow through a development life cycle. Now, when it comes to our security, that's where we want to start baking in security right up from. So, so at the very genesis, when we're talking, when, the, when your engineers or whoever it may be, your developers are looking at the initial concept, that is where we want to start layering in our security whether it's developing our security plans, doing our risk assessment up front as it moves through that. We want to start selecting, okay, what type of controls do we think we're going to have to put in place to start protecting that capability as well as even when it's in its concept development or refinement, how do we bring these pieces together so that no one, no one else, another competitor, don't have access to our intellectual property. Then as we're building it, we're updating documentation, we're developing assessment plans. Okay, how do we assess the, the security posture and so that we can actually get it authorized to be sold to the customer and then out from there, how we do continuous monitoring of that from a security perspective. So it all fits together in a life cycle model where security, again, is baked in and we don't just try to bolt it on, which usually happens many times. Our production side of the house gets to hear and go, hey, what about security? And now we're playing catch up, trying to get all of these things done so we can get that asset so sold to uh, whoever the customer may be. I know we've covered a lot of things in this, uh, in this presentation, everything from security governance, some of our cybersecurity principles such as CIA and, and access control. We talked about security in depth. We looked at risk, risk mitigation strategies. We talked about the different frameworks, how security controls are used, and we wrapped it up, put it all together, and looked at the system development life cycle. Hey, have a great week one, and I will guarantee you, you open your book, and you will not see any of this in there because this is all stuff that, in addition, hopefully to help make you a better cybersecurity professional when you you know when you hit the streets okay have a great week one if you have questions reach out we'll be there sounds like a a, a song from the 1970s motown i'll be there reach out <laughs> i know bad bad have a great week and we will see you god bless